Hi everyone, this is David Chu, and we're going to talk about a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage treatment using pars plana vitrectomy and panretinal photocoagulation. And we're going to take this from the top the same as before. We're going to start by putting in our ports for standard three port pars plana vitrectomy. So uh, we're sitting superiorly, and this patient um, has surgery for the left eye, and we're going to put an inferior temporal port and then two ports superiorly, superior temporally as well as superior nasally. And so that's what we're doing here. They're four millimeters posterior to the limbus because this patient is phagic. Here you see that we're engaging the infusion in the inferior temporal port and we're gonna start looking inside. Right away, we're gonna notice, well, you can't see very much. There's a dense vitreous hemorrhage over here that's obscuring the view to the retina. And so just like we can't see directly to the retina, the patient's not gonna be able to see very much out of this eye as well. And so we're gonna proceed pretty cautiously and we're gonna try to clear the core central vitreous but because we don't have direct visualization of the retina, we really do have to go slowly and deliberately to make sure that we don't inadvertently cut any retina that may be detached and uh, closer into the central portion of the vitreous. That white that you're seeing focally are some, co uh, some condensations of the hemoglobinized vitreous hemorrhage, and we're gonna slowly try to clear all that away. And now as, you, as we're doing this, you can start to appreciate where the optic nerve is, and we're gonna slowly be able to see more and more per, uh, portions of the retina and the retinal vessels here. And again, what we're trying to do is clear the central core vitreous first. That's usually a, a standard principle, although there are exceptions for doing vitrectomy. You wanna clear the, the core vitreous and then tackle the cortical and peripheral vitreous. So we're just zooming in a little bit to give ourselves a, a better visualization, and you can see uh, down to the retina behind it and so far the retina is looking not too bad uh, and by that I mean there's not a lot of pre-retinal hemorrhage there's no tractional retinal detachment that we, that we can appreciate so far there's not a lot of neovascularization that's uh, obviously visible here now because the, the vitreous here you can see is not uh, you know bright red it's, it's more dehemoglobinized we can tell that this patient's had this vitreous hemorrhage uh, for some time it's a little bit chronic here and when you see this kind of appearance, not only intraoperatively, but in the clinic, there's a good chance this kind of vitreous hemorrhage isn't gonna go away by virtue of the fact that it's been there in the eye for a little while. And so again, we're gonna continue clearing up this vitreous over here, and we've uh, done a pretty reasonable job at clearing out the central area, and we can, we can visualize the entire macula. There are dot blot hemorrhages here, uh, but, and obviously the presence of the vitreous hemorrhage suggests that there's active proliferative diabetic retinopathy, uh, but fortunately, again, we don't see any tractional components here. And now that we've cleared out the peripheral, we've cleared out the core vitreous, we're going to start tackling the periphery. And so you can see that we're uh, moving our cutter into the far peripheral corners. We're still maintaining reasonable visualization, keeping the cutter right in the center of uh, the beam of illumination, making sure that we can see not only the cutter, the vitreous gel, but also the retina behind it so that we can stay safe over here. Um, and that's an important principle when you're doing vitrectomy, just to keep yourself really aligned. And uh, as they say, the light pipe is the most important instrument uh, in the entire surgery because that, with good visualization, is how you stay efficient and safe. With our left hand, we've successfully removed all the temporal vitreous that's present here. And we're going to switch over to the same thing with the nasal peripheral vitreous. So one thing that makes it easier in this case is that the vitreous is nicely stained by the hemorrhage and so you can really see that vitreous gel. In a patient without a vitreous hemorrhage, you really wanna be able to use your light pipe efficiently so that you can highlight that gel. Uh, it's not gonna be as clear as in this case. Now that we've removed the vitreous, we're gonna take a good look at the retina, the macula, the optic nerve. There's a little uh, piece of vitreous still attached to the, the uh, optic nerve and we've just cut and removed that there. And the retina, again, uh, otherwise looks pretty flat. So you can't tell what a patient's visual prognosis is at the time of a vitreous surgery, but you can have some idea and you can tell that, you know, this patient has a good shot of doing well. Uh, so what we're doing over here is inspecting the retinal periphery. It's a key step for any uh, vitrectomy to make sure that there are no occult peripheral breaks over here. And we're going to do that 360 degrees of the eye. And we're not going to necessarily show every single quadrant, but you definitely want to uh, do your due diligence and explore that. So far, everything in the peripheral retina is looking good. I'm not seeing any breaks or tears. 
And it's also reassuring that for this patient, we're gonna apply panretinal photocoagulation 360 degrees. And so any small break or something else there, we're gonna be able to cover and treat that. And you'll see that pretty soon. So there's two disease modifying therapies that we're really applying for this surgery. Number one, uh, we're removing the vitreous and that's what retains the vitreous hemorrhage, that's what retains the VEGF and provides a scaffold for uh, surface proliferation of fibrosis. Now that we've removed that, we're gonna turn to panretinal photocoagulation and that's the second thing. That ablates the peripheral retina, decreases the peripheral uh, ischemia that's gonna drive secretion of VEGF and all the, uh, the proliferation that comes with it. And so you can do this obviously in the clinic using a, a laser indirect or a slit lamp mounted laser. However, with a patient's vitreous hemorrhage, you weren't able to uh, perform that for this particular patient. And that's why we're doing this in the operating room. Doing it with endolaser has some advantages. It's very controlled, it's very quick and efficient, and it's more comfortable for the patient. Now the probe that we're using here is a curved, flexible, illuminated laser probe. This is all in a 25 gauge system. And what this allows us to do is in a patient who's phagic like this patient is, uh, we're able to cross over and really treat the peripheral retina. And that's not possible with a standard light pipe and retractor. We can't cross more than midline. Here, the natural curve, as you can see on the instrument, allows us to get around the phagic lens and be able to do that safely without uh, damaging the patient's lens. The laser is illuminated too. And so that allows us to have your other hand free if we wanted to, in order to help depress or to uh, uh, insert another instrument into the eye. In this case, we're just using the light pipe in the other eye, which is, which is giving us peripheral illumination to further keep us oriented in the eye and keep us safe. And so we're basically gonna go around you know, 360 degrees. You're seeing that I'm going across the eye in order to treat the contralateral retina. This gives me more range of motion and makes it a little bit faster and easier for me. And this is the standard way that we're doing that. Different surgeons are gonna have a different preference as far as how posterior they're gonna want that laser to extend. Here, we're getting about a disc to two disc diameters away from the arcade. And this patient obviously had a fairly significant vitreous hemorrhage. And so we're gonna give this patient the maximal treatment that's possible while still minimizing any uh, visual field defect and nyctalopia that the patient's gonna experience. You're gonna see after we finish this step of the laser, we're gonna scleral the press and apply laser up to the aura serrata. And that's gonna additionally treat the rest of the retina that we can't see by direct visualization here. The spacing of the, the spots is fairly important. You know, it does vary um, depending on the, the surgeon's preference, but these spots, you do wanna space them out more than if you were applying endolaser for retinopexy, treating a peripheral break or treating retinal detachments. The goal is not to be able to really seal in any subretinal fluid. It's to prevent that peripheral ischemia and ablate that peripheral retina. And so because those jobs are different, you don't need to have that same level of confluence. And so we're just showing as we're finally filling in the last peripheral parts of the retina and we're gonna uh, start applying that scleral depressed laser. And so now we have one hand where we're inside of the eye with our illuminated laser and with our other, we're applying peripheral uh, scleral depression outside of the eye. And that's bringing in the peripheral retina, allowing us to visualize just a little bit more and allow us to apply that treatment anteriorly. After we finish that all around the eye, what we're doing now is performing a final air fluid exchange and putting a little bit of an air bubble inside of the eye. And that's just like that. So that light that you're seeing is the reflection off of the air fluid interface. That little bit of air does also help seal our sclerotomy. So that's an added advantage over here. We're gonna remove all the ports and then that completes our case. Thanks for your attention.